Last November, Shahid Khan, a 62-year-old Pakistani-born billionaire, bought pro football's Jacksonville Jaguars for $770 million. The deal made Khan the first ethnic minority to own a team in the NFL. And that may be the least interesting thing about him. With this engaging personality and unflagging optimism, Khan has taken the city of Jacksonville, Florida by storm. He's become the town's leading cheerleader and has plans to turn the Jaguars into an international brand. Shad, as he prefers to be called, came to the U.S. at age 16 with $500 to his name. Within two decades, he built a successful auto parts business and amassed a fortune. The Jaguars haven't had a winning season in four years and have never been to the Super Bowl. They're also a team short on big-name players, and that's put Shad Khan in a unique position for a rookie owner. He is the face of the franchise. The story will continue in a moment. I love you, guy. I love you. Who has a bigger mustache? <laughs> hey, there's a good-looking woman. 90 minutes to kick off in the Jaguars' most popular personality wasn't in the locker room or warming up on the field. Woo! He was in the stadium parking lot, drawing a crowd. So, Byron, it's probably a really humbling day for 60 Minutes. <laughs> you know, nobody cares about 60 Minutes. Everybody cares about the Jaguars. Isn't that amazing? Less than a year into his tenure, Shad Khan is a phenomenon. His rakish mustache has become a must-have accessory for any self-respecting Jags fan. Thank you so much. We are so happy that you're here with us. Oh, thank you so much. He has an approval rating any politician would envy, 78%. He's his team's advertising spokesman. I'm Jaguars owner Shot Khan, and I'm all in. And pokes fun at himself in this music video spoof. Opa! Gangnam style. There's a part of you that seems to me that, that is a salesman. I think it's human interaction. I mean, they're already here. They bought the tickets. They're very little to sell. I mean, it's, uh, if anything, selling hope. Are we going to cover the spread? <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Oh. Good. Thank you. While Khan enjoys rock star status today, news that a Muslim from Pakistan had bought the Jaguars did not go over well with everyone in this conservative corner of Northeast Florida. Thank you, pal. Thanks. In comments quoted in online media, Khan was called, among other things, a terrorist from Pakistan, a sand monkey. One person asked, if you buy a Jag season ticket, does it come with a prayer rug? How'd you react to that? Uh, well, um, you know, the way I've reacted most of my life, which is it's really not my problem, it's their problem. It was not Jacksonville's finest moment. So it's true that the former owner, uh, Wayne Weaver, was so embarrassed that he offered you a chance to get out of the deal. Well, uh, please, I wouldn't characterize it that way. I think he was, uh, he was surprised and uh, he wanted to just wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, it wasn't giving me pause. And it gave you none at all? None whatsoever. It was like, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if, you know, if it was possible for me to be more determined, it, you know, gave me more determination. That determination can be traced back to a childhood half a world away in the hot, dusty streets of Lahore. Pakistan's second largest city. This is the Lahore Fort. Last and spring, we went to Lahore with Khan to visit his family. Hi! <laughs> he took us to his boyhood home. Meet my guest. Hello, madam. This is Byron. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. So where we met his 89-year-old mother, Zakia, a retired math professor, and his younger brother, Farhan, a businessman. How do you explain it? Your son. Your boy is one of the richest men in the world. How do you explain that? Well, it's his hard work and luck also. As his friends say, he always knew about his destiny. Mm. He was always here. He had that entrepreneur, uh, uh, I would say, in instincts, which made him succeed like this. Khan's late father, Rafiq, sold serving equipment. He preached humility and frugality and encouraged his son's early business ventures. As a child, 
Khan built and sold radios and made his friends pay to borrow his comic books. And this is where the future owner of an American pro football team spent many afternoons as a boy, the city's cricket stadium, home to Pakistan's national team. This is where, you know, the big sports events happen. So this was your Yankee Stadium, your Soldier Field? Yeah, absolutely. We would walk over and, um, you know, get here after tea time so we could walk in free. And that was important because your dad wasn't big on spending money on tickets. No, he was not. Uh, never bought one ticket. Ever. <laughs> and proud of that. And yeah, proud of that. <laughs> that evening, chatting over tea above Lahore's Royal Mosque, we were treated to a regular feature of Pakistani life, a cut in power. Now, that happens a lot in yes. Pakistan, I've noticed. Yes. When the lights came back on, we talked about coming home. When Many people come home, they revel in being at home again, and they wax nostalgic about what it means to be back. But you're not that way. Why? Because, oh my God, I mean, you know, you've been here. See how hard things are. You know, power's going out. It's 108 degrees. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's tough. And, but I think uh, this is physical things. I think the biggest uh, impediment here is that hope. And, you know, getting to the next stage, it doesn't matter, um, you know, uh, how hard you work. There are forces that kind of, uh, you know, prevent you from uh, being the best you can be. In January 1967, with $500 in his pocket, Shad Khan set out for America. He was 16 years old. He'd been accepted at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana to study mechanical engineering. He spent his first night at the local YMCA. So your room was on this side of the building or the uh, other side? It was a dormitory, I believe, was this side right here, yeah. His room at the Y set him back just $2. But Khan was so afraid of running out of money, he headed out the next morning to find a job. Got up and walked up on Wright Street, and, you know, they were hiring dishwashers. A buck 20 was, wow, you know, I think I'm going to make it. This is my liberation. I control my destiny. And a job washing dishes? Yes. Would allow you to control your own destiny? Absolutely. Buck 20 an hour. That's big money. Uh, I mean, more than what 99% uh, of the people in Pakistan were making. I can control my destiny. I can control my life. The teenager from Pakistan adapted easily to life on the Illinois campus. He was invited to join the highly selective and all-white Beta Theta Pi fraternity. Why do you think they accepted you? Were you a novelty to them? I think it was definitely a novelty for them. Sure, John Smith from Cleveland, <laughs> Michael Thompson from Chicago, and oh, Shahid Khan from Pakistan. Exactly. Uh, so it was it's kind of fun for them uh, to see what, what this is going to turn out to be. It turned out well for Khan. Through a frat brother, he met fellow student Ann Carlson. After dating for 11 years, as Khan built his business, he and Ann married at a Las Vegas wedding chapel. They have two grown children. It gets awfully loud in here. Yeah, it's loud in here. It's the sound of money. <laughs> Shot Khan made his fortune in, of all things, truck bumpers. Right out of college, he went to work for a small company called Flexengate, where he helped perfect the first one-piece truck bumper. It was revolutionary, lightweight, and didn't rust. Khan bought the company in 1980 for $800,000. So today you make bumpers for how many different kinds of cars and trucks? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Flexingate parts are on two-thirds of all the cars and trucks sold in America. Last year it had sales of $3.5 billion. And all those bumpers landed Khan on the Forbes list of the 400 richest people in America. Just keep me posted, and then I think, you know, we'll figure out what to do. He's been living the American dream for 45 years and has been a citizen since 1991. But Khan's ethnic background has made him a victim of racial profiling. In the aftermath of 9-11, he says traveling back to the U.S. became a humiliating ordeal. There were endless questions and searches by immigration. On one occasion, he was detained while crossing the bridge between Canada and Detroit. Got thrown in the brig. Thrown in jail? Well, they had a little holding pen uh, in the bridge. How long were you sitting there? 
maybe five, six hours. But you know, what's disturbing is they take your passport, they take the phone, they take everything. So you are just sitting there helpless for hours. Yeah. You're a successful businessman. You've yeah. done nothing wrong. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's like their intentions are good. That's, that's... Oh, come on now, you are the most generous <laughs> man. You're, you're always willing to give people the benefit of the doubt, make yeah. excuses for people for the things yeah. that they do. Well, you know, I gotta be honest with you, that's about the only thing that kind of made me a little bit angry. While he enjoys returning to Pakistan to see family, Khan says he's concerned by the radical shift in political attitudes there. When we were with you in Lahore, uh, one of the shop owners, we asked him when did things begin to change in Pakistan, and he said, went like this, yeah. <laughs> when the long beards took over. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's absolutely right. And I think it's not religion itself. I mean, it's, it's the baggage that comes with it, frankly, that uh, uh, it's in the name of a religion people are doing horrible things. In the Pakistan of your youth, you could, whatever your faith was, was acceptable. Absolutely. Uh, it, not only was it acceptable, it was respected. The man who grew up on cricket in Pakistan says his passion for American football began at the University of Illinois, cheering on the fighting Illini. With financial success came the opportunity to buy into the game at the highest level. Khan says he leaves the football side of the business to others, but expects the best from his players. So one of his first moves was to provide them with what's said to be the best locker room in the NFL. And so this is about comfort, this is about recognition, this is about setting the standards. Mm. And in a strategy he hopes will pay dividends for the team and Jacksonville, he announced plans for the Jaguars to play one home game in London for the next four seasons. But Shah Khan's biggest challenge will be fielding a more competitive team. Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, a disaster. The Jaguars appear headed for their fifth straight losing season. Bad news for a team that's already the least valuable, least popular franchise in the NFL. Why did you buy this team? Why not buy one of the, for lack of a better phrasing, marquee NFL teams? Well, because you buy what's available for sale. Uh, so this isn't like going on Craigslist and picking up an NFL team, okay? You know, for me, it's been like fate. It's just like saying, you know, I'm from Pakistan, you were 16. Why go to Champaign-Urbana? Why not go to New York or go someplace else? Well, because it was Champaign-Urbana. I mean, it was fate. It was destiny. It was Kismet. Same thing here. 